So we're just about to get started on the, the last two panels of the day. Um, and I'm very happy to have Trish Audette Longo here. She's a professor at the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton. Um, and she's going to be moderating a panel on the potential harms of fact checking. Um, I think we will start uh, by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to uh, lean into alphabetical order here and ask Corinne to go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Corinne Abusef. Uh, I'm an editor at The Walrus. Uh, I got to work with Vivian on an essay about the state of fact checking uh, a few years ago. Um, so I'm also coming at the, the conversation from that place. Um, and yeah, coming at it from the perspective of a writer and editor who has often worked with the fact-checking department at the Walrus on a ton of stories. Thank you. Uh, and Nicholas. Uh, I think we'll just pause for a moment. Nicholas, I think you might be muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, my name's Nick Cryer, Nicholas Cryer. I uh, do storytelling and community networking liaison with Megaphone Magazine here in Vancouver, and I also report for them. And I also do some uh, stuff around research ethics here as well. Okay, thank you so much. And Zoe. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm currently an associate prof at Carleton in sociology, uh, and I sit on the educational review committee for the Walrus. So I've had a bit of an opportunity to see how truth, uh, well, fact checking <laughs> works uh, within the magazine, but from a very outside perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to start with with the question for this panel, which is, how might fact checking or accuracy checking sometimes be problematic? or have harmful effects. Uh, and I think we will start again with Kareem. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think for me as an editor, the thing I worry about most is uh, that maybe some stories don't get told if we're too insistent on a specific kind of fact checking. So perhaps personal stories from communities that haven't uh, emphasized record keeping in a specific way or whose records have been lost. Um, or stories where people talk about their experiences with like assault or mental illness. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it's more concern about what doesn't get told uh, if that process is too strict, I guess. Okay, thank you. And Nicholas? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, sure. I think uh, the most harmful effects uh, for me, in my experience, have been with stigmatization of community members. Um, when the media perpetuates or sensationalizes uh, negative stereotypes about people, about uh, our community, what's, sees, what's seen here, uh, and then what's thought to be going on here because of what's seen or uh, expressed in the media uh, can, can lead to, um, you know, kind of a categorization of, of people that, that isn't really there considering the person a lot of them haven't been spoken to about it, about it or whatever things can be taken out of context uh the way people describe the neighborhood uh can just be really really hurtful a lot of times imagery and whatnot words mostly and zoe uh, I work on uh, Indigenous sovereignty and fish, and one of the challenges is that who's considered an expert in those spaces is usually scientists, not Indigenous community members and knowledge keepers. And so there is a really strong deferral to scientists who will say, well, that can't possibly be true or this can't possibly be happening when community members are saying, no, literally for generations we've, we've observed this and this is, this is what we know to be true. Um, and often there's a default to scientific perspectives uh, that can be really harmful to the sovereignty of communities to assert their laws and their rights, especially around issues with what I, I am familiar with, fisheries, but also other environmental governance issues. And so a real reliance on the state, on police, on corporations and on scientists uh, to know what is true versus what communities know to be true. And I think that can be really uh, dangerous. As you were coming into this panel, is there is there a particular time that you're drawing on or a particular example that you're thinking about um, 
when fact checking has, has gone wrong or has been particularly harmful. Um, and this, this time I might start with Nicholas. Um, yeah, there's one story, I guess, there's lots of stories. Uh, recently, there was a, one done uh, with a friend of mine named Julie Chapman. She's a co-author on the research manifesto that we, we worked on together. And the CBC did a story about her and uh, not about her, about the downtown east side. And it was just really uh, negative and, and stereotypical with pictures of the crowded tent city and, and whatnot down here. And they kind of uh, quoted, you know, she, I'm sure she said lots of good things, but the only quotes they really gave her were uh, uh, about how negative it is down here and how it's crazy. And, and if you've never been down here, it can look, be really intimidating and stuff. And just typing up this, this negative uh, aura that downtown Eastside has. I mean, I'm not denying that this neighborhood has a, you know, a plethora of social issues, um, everything from mental health to addictions to, uh, to indigenous sovereignty even. Um, are issues down here that are, a lot of them are out in the open and the overdose crisis is uh, dragging on for, you know, years now and, and people are exhausted, burnt out from both responding to it and from the grief of losing people. Um, the housing crisis here is out of hand, right? There are the 10 cities uh, popping up, like three of them are just around this neighborhood I know of. Um, <clears throat> and people are really struggling with that. Uh, and I, there, we don't need the, uh, the perpetuation of the stigma that was already here, you know, being, being kind of enhanced, I guess, by, by mainstream media. That's what Megaphone is, is such a good outlet here because uh, it's sort of it's really grassroots movement kind of operated by people who know the community and, uh, and have access to, to, to the real, you know, personal opinions of, of the people that live here as opposed to a reporter coming down and just sort of like picking someone that looks interesting and, and getting their sort of quick draft idea of, of what's going on. Um, we have, like, that was when my position was created is because I'm, I'm known to the community and I, I know lots of people and I wouldn't consider myself an expert in anything really, but I'm just, uh, I have the perspective of having been around and so I know that Julie is not saying when she says it can seem pretty crazy down here, whatever, it's not really what she means. I mean, uh, from outside perspective, it might appear hectic, but Julie also sits on, you know, multiple boards of directors. Um, she's a co-author. She went to school with me at Langara last year. Like she's, in, you know, and so many people in here have active life lives like that, that, you know, are, are on par with, with professional anything really, they would put in the time that uh, that a professional would have put in, the same amount of time as a professional would have put in, uh, and they're not regarded as such really. So uh, that's that's beginning to change now. We're working on changing that a lot, you know, just in our own little corner of the world here. Can I just ask um, when you're when you're thinking of that example, do you see that as as an example of reporting being harmful and also sort of fact checking being harmful or yeah, is there a separation? Both, both, I think the reporting and the fact checking probably, I mean, um, a lot of times they don't, they won't bring the story back and and like journalistic license or whatever tells them they don't have to double check with the people before they run the piece, right? So, um, that that can be harmful it's in terms of like is this okay if i say this about you i mean the way you said this and stuff is that is that okay do you are you okay with that i don't see why why that would be a, a major issue for people to do that it just seems courteous common courtesy to me but at the same time um that's what they do right in, in mainstream in mainstream media and uh i recently did a piece i mean i'm guilty of it myself even uh, we didn't have a fact checker on the opinion piece that I wrote in the TAI recently, uh, which is of course just an opinion piece, um, but still it's it's probably got, you know, it, I tried to make it as balanced as possible, but I also didn't talk to a lot of cops when I wrote it, and uh, for all I know I could have hurt some of their feelings, and, uh, and I, I feel bad about that. I mean, you know, I'm not uh, the biggest fan of cops around here, but 
uh, I didn't mean to hurt anybody either, right? Uh, and so we have to think about that as journalists and fact checkers, I guess, um, that we want to get things accurate. I mean, details accurate too, but you also want to think about people's feelings and the feelings of the readers too. How are readers going to feel about this um, being said? You know, maybe they know that person, maybe maybe they know that situation, and uh, and can and know that it's not being portrayed accurately, and now their their feelings are hurt because you're talking about their friends, right, or their their work, their coworkers, or whatever. Um, and those are important. Those are important issues in journalism, I think. We we tackled the question with research recently in academic research, and I think commercial research, research is next. But uh, the, we need a manifesto for for ethical research in downtown east side, and that's what this fact checking guide is hopefully going to be. Thank you, um, Zoe. Can I ask about an example that comes to mind? Um, I think exactly what Nicholas was just talking about, about um, how journalistic ethics sort of say that you can't show a story to a subject before it's published so that you maintain objectivity. But um, I remember I, I was at a, a, a journalism um, uh, course and they had invited me in to talk about environmental journalism. And, and I said, well, you know, it's something that we're trying to accomplish as Indigenous scholars in the academy is to teach academics that, you know, this idea of objectivity was invented <laughs> by the colonizers uh, to allow them to tell their stories on their terms and not and not check in with the people that they're telling stories about. And um, the reaction in the room from the journalists that were on the course was like just absolute horror, like that I would tell them that they should actually talk to the subjects and give them a sense of how they're going to be portrayed. And I realized that I feel like that's a hangover from a time when journalism was explicitly supposed to be reporting on the wealthy and the, and the rich and you know telling truth about how they were operating and that there hasn't been like a I know that this conference is obviously part of that effort to shift that relationship um and so exactly I just all I can say is like everything that Nicholas is saying is exactly um what has to change because that idea that journalists are these sort of like you know people that are separate from the systems of power that they're studying it doesn't hold up. Uh, if you know, as we talk in, in anthropology about the difference between like studying up and studying, you know, laterally within our own communities. And when you're studying up, that's a very different relationship. You're looking at power structures, you know. Um, but when you're working within your own community, you have to be really mindful of of how you're telling stories and and the way I, I talk about my experiences working in the academy and talking about administrators and people who have power over me is very different than how I, I work um, with stories that are shared with me and then I'm collaborating with about community members who've invited me uh, to do stuff on fish to help further their sovereignty. So I don't have like an explicit example, but I just remember just the like collective horror in that room when I said, well, shouldn't you let people know what you're going to publish about them <laughs> because that's something we, you know, we've had to push really hard to have happen in the academy and uh, and we had a really fruitful discussion. But like I don't think we came to an agreement at the end. Like they still couldn't wrap their heads around uh, that. And I realized we're just coming from very different perspectives. I kind of love the the idea of of sort of shifting from a time of if I may, and maybe I'm not quite getting it right, but punching up to sort of how do we kind of work horizontally and with communities. And I'm, I'm curious as, as you're thinking about that, you know, what, what could actually be done? Like, so that maybe journalists aren't um, surprised at that idea, but like what could actually be done in the future? That's yes, sorry, that's right. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's about also positioning yourself as the storyteller or the journalist and being really aware of how you're situated. And uh, sorry, this is Dominic. He's my fact checker. He always <laughs> um, but, it, you know, I think it's about really being aware of what position, what licenses we hold within a space. And, um, you know, academics can be guilty of it, too. You know, academics who study power can kind of be like, oh, I don't have any power. And it's like, well, no, you do. Uh, it just depends on where you are situated within a system. And so I think, like, it also takes a lot of integrity. Uh, and, like, Nicholas, everything you just said just shows, like, the deep integrity of your work because you're so conscious of not, you know, I think that's exactly how other journalists, uh, you know, need to think about things is, like, who do you hold, you know, obligations to? And 
um, journalists are parts part of the community. A lot of my friends are journalists, you know, and they're they're really wonderful people. And my favorite journalists are the folks who really are carefully thinking about uh, where do you sit within a community and um, yeah, and how do you do that work with care? And there are really amazing journalists in Canada who do that work, and and I'm really grateful uh, that they're continuing to enact those obligations of care. Thank you. Um, Corinne, this, this question of an example you can think of when, when fact-checking has done harm, I'm curious what, how you're kind of sitting with that question. Yeah, I mean, like Zoe, I couldn't think of an explicit example, um, but I'm also not on the receiving end of some of this coverage, so I understand if that, um, you know, if perhaps like we there are sources that feel differently about some of the stories that I've worked on. Um, and so I think one of the things I'm constantly trying to do as an editor is um, like have more conversations, even just like at the commissioning stage, like before a story is even assigned, um, discussing with their, our fact checking team and with the writer, um, like what would that process look like, um, making sure the sources are comfortable with that process, they understand uh, what is expected of them, what, how they're going to appear. So I guess like implement, implementing a lot of what um, I guess was mentioned in the previous panel around informed consent. Um, and so trying to have those conversations beforehand as much as possible. Um, the downside of that, of course, is that that can take a lot longer. Um, and I know that that's difficult when you're a writer or an editor and you're just excited to get started on a story or you want to start working on it as soon as possible. Or sometimes there's certain deadlines attached to a project. Um, I think magazine allows uh, for a bit of that, um, but um, it can still be a challenge for sure. Are there problematic ways of approaching accuracy and approaching verification in journalism? So this is kind of one of the, the bigger questions, <laughs> um, but are there, are there better ways of approaching these ideas? Um, I, will, I will start with Zoe and then kind of starting with a different person each time. So go ahead, Zoe. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this ahead of time. And I think that, you know, there's folks who have access to lawyers and legal teams who are going to help them provide an answer that might be truthful, but doesn't have integrity. Uh, and then there are people who don't have access to that kind of wordsmithing. You know, institutions have legal teams that vet everything that goes out. And so, um, and I've noticed lately that a lot of institutions have realized the best way to deal with a scandal is not to respond to it. Um, but that just creates even more harm to the communities that are being impacted. So, um, you know, I, I think that truth has to follow with integrity. And the question is like, are we working towards transforming something? And I, I know that's not a, an answer <laughs> to, you know, but I think a har one of the harmful ways to go about this is in like a cynical way to kind of uh, maliciously comply the way some institutions do or politicians and other bodies do to kind of give a really meaningless answer. It may be true, but there's no integrity behind it. They're just trying to save their, their you know, save themselves from scrutiny or further, um, further being held accountable. So I think that <clears throat> integrity has to be coupled with truth uh, or fact checking and just, you know, does this hold up? Does this make sense? Um, but that, that, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Corinne. Um, yeah, and so I think for me, one of the things that I think about a lot is sort of the way we think about um, objectivity or um, facts as like sort of devoid of emotion um, and so I think, or rather emotion from certain kinds of people or certain kinds of communities, um, like as an editor, I'm always trying to balance these things. Like how do I edit something, typically a personal narrative, like in these cases, uh, so it appears accurate without sort of like forcing the writer into a certain kind of like objective tone. Um, and that may not ring true to them or their community. Um, and like, obviously with that comes like questions around like, who is this piece like really for? Uh, like who is the audience um and it feels like fact checking ca like can be an extension of that for sure thank you um nicholas are, are there problematic ways of approaching accuracy and verification in journalism um <clears throat> yeah the the manifesto we wrote around research uh doesn't cover journalistic research it's mostly meant for 
for academia, and that's been galvanized a lot. I mean, it's been made required reading for first year medical students uh, at UBC. So that was five years ago. But um, the the guide that we're that we worked on with Carlton now is is brilliantly comprehensive in uh, covering covering all those details and and yeah integrity is, is key for if you're going to be talking about about people um, and about situations that maybe you're not uh, a part of or whatever I mean it's obviously more uh, important if you are a part of it and you're representing that community uh, to have integrity about what you're speaking of, of. Um, but when for, that's not often the case, most communities don't have, you know, uh, storytelling community networking liaisons in their local paper, whatever. Uh, Megaphone is kind of a really special place for that, where they specifically um, created a position for that. And I think mainstream media would probably do well to, to uh, consider that uh, in the future. Have like they call it peer engagement, and that would be people based in a community. That, uh, that know it, that know you know the situation going on, or uh, have access to, to people who know you know the details of that situation, and can can uh, can reliably provide facts that can be checked. Um, as for you know the emotional content, I think um, everyone wants to be seen in a good light, right? Everyone wants their 15 minutes of fame or their their quote. Uh, to be to be recognized, to be acknowledged in, in you know in public, um, and that requires respect too. Uh, you know, just because they may have messed up what they what they said doesn't doesn't necessarily give us the right to to publish it in the context that we think that it should be published or whatever, right? Um, and I think you know it doesn't take that much of an effort to just call the person and say. Just want to run this by you one time before we go to print, and I think that would make a, a, a lot of difference in the in the in the publishing end of it. And uh, who knows, it might lead to, to bigger things. Okay, thank you. Um, I love the idea of a care engagement person, and I'm curious what that could look like. Um. um Peer engagement in our community usually means lived experience. You're involving someone with uh, experience from their personal lives around uh, around the issues. So if it's if it's overdose crisis, a lot of our responders are current or former drug users, um, and there will be like my work at the Moal Overdose Prevention Unit. I was hired based on my experience in the neighborhood around drug use. Uh, the drug users resource center and the whole thing like it was based around the fact that I use drugs and that um, the when I'm responding to them people uh, that I'm responding to know me they'll come out of the overdose and they know me and they'd rather see a familiar face than a, um, a total stranger that they don't trust right because then I'm more likely to be able to talk them into the ambulance or whatever but with the paramedics uh, and in journalism, that would might that might make a difference too, right? But they would be more willing to speak to somebody that they know than that they somebody they don't, uh, as well as trust that person more than somebody they don't. Because there's a lot of suspicion, especially with Native people, around journalists and, and media print, you know, print writing in particular is is suspicious to them because of all the residential school trauma. Um, so, you know, I even, I've struggled with myself a lot of times get, getting people to talk about anything, like especially Native people, they're like, well, you're one of those, you're one of those fancy Natives that write, uh, I don't know if I trust you. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that's changing a lot, right? There's a lot of uh, big things going on around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that has opened a lot of options and avenues for us as Native people and as marginalized communities to have access to, to participating in the discussions, to being at the table, to representing ourselves, right? And uh, I think that yeah, this, this fact-checking guide will go a long way to, to uh, be inclusive in that way. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um,
So as you're approaching your own work and in your own work, how, how are you sort of thinking about ways that these practices can be adopted or adapted um, to mitigate the potential harm of fact checking? Like what can we take from some of the work that, that you all are doing um, and apply that in fact, in fact checking? Um, and I believe this time I will start with Corinne. Um, yeah, so I guess my hope is that I can, you know, be more flexible, more collaborative with writers and sources and fact checkers to produce something that's right or that feels right. Um, I think a big part of that, like, again, is, is just like building in more time to have these conversations with um, like all the parties involved or like building in a longer period for a certain type of source to get back to us. Uh, perhaps someone who is unhoused, like may need a few more days to respond to a fact checking call. Uh, perhaps it's a question of instead of looking up like a family record, we speak to a family member about a certain thing. All these things like take a bit more time, but I think having the foresight to like build that into a story that you can see is going to, you know, have those, um, um, let's, let's not call them roadblocks, but just like have those issues come up like throughout. Um, yeah, and those are things I just want to keep doing, I suppose. Is there time? Like, yeah, is there time for this to build in more time? Um, yes and no. Um, so I think um, some of this is just sort of like forward planning on the part of the writer and the editor and things like that. But then there's also just like the realities of uh, production deadlines and trying to get the right mix in for a certain issue and, you know, things like that. So I think, um, the onus is certainly on the editor to try and make that happen, um, but definitely there's there's constraints on that. Okay, thank you, um, Nicholas. How are you thinking about these issues in your own work, and and what kinds of practices can be adopted to mitigate potential harm? Um, in my own work, we're trying to build something called a community research ethics workshop in the downtown east side, which would be kind of like a research ethics board. At uh, at the academic institutions that they have. And we've done a few practice reviews of uh, PhD dissertations and whatnot going through their, their application before it actually goes to the, the ethics board at the university. And um, most people were, you know, quite grateful for their, their participation. And uh, we provide a lot of input that I guess they, they didn't get from the ethics board that the ethics board was not thinking about uh, questions, you know, of uh, informed consent and whatnot. Um, so what we'd like to have in, in built into that is a separate stream for journalists in particular, right? We've got the academic researchers and downtown east side is one of the heavy, most heavily researched communities in the world. So we have this inundation of research constantly coming in here and, and doing studies of the people and, and their issues. And then, you know, not so much with media, but uh, we do have a lot of stories being told down here um, around, you know, the issues that are going on. And so I think it would be important to have a, a built into this, it wouldn't be, you know, this physical space for um, people to meet and uh, contact to be made between, you know, the journalists and the subjects or whatever. Because a lot of times here with homelessness, with uh, the lack of access to technology and stuff, phones and stuff, it's hard to find people. It's hard to find uh, you know, sources or contacts or, or people to network with. And I think somebody, you know, having a physical space and somebody coordinating that on a full-time basis would be, would be ideal uh, so that the media would have, you know, somewhere to go to meet central, that's central, you know, um, 312 Main would be a great housing for it. Uh, and then also so that the community would know where to go when, you know, um, when there's a story about to happen, I say, okay, there's, you know, the editor could contact the one coordinator and then uh, the coordinator could say, yeah, I know the person that, that would be good for that story. I'll go find them and then you guys can both meet in this one central place or online or whatever. Uh, you know, they can come and we'll have a computer for them to use if it's a Zoom meeting or whatever. And, and just the logistics of that, uh, you know, need to be funded, obviously. Um, and that, that's where we're at right now is looking for operational funding. Because in my mind, I have it all organized, right? It's this great dream for the community to be able to use. 
and then yeah, there's of course there's funding and uh, there's obligations and restraints. And uh, yeah, it really, like Zoe said, it comes down to time. Just put, being willing to put in the time if you want the story to be, you know, accurate and holistic, I guess. Uh, then, then you'd want to put in the time to make sure to get everybody's uh, at the table for the right reasons, right? Do you envision for for that? Do you envision sort of a, a review process as well? Maybe not to the same extent as a sort of ethics review that would mirror what happens at universities, right. but. That, that sounds, I mean, just as important as uh, as a person getting their PhD, really, to me, would, would be, you know, this is my one time in the media, my one, you know, big chance in media. My mom's going to read this and stuff. I, I want to make sure I, I said the right thing or whatever, that uh, the journalist isn't making me look bad. Because some of these stories can just be so so bad. They take statistics and spin them, and, and uh, all of a sudden, it's like my mom's terrified uh, to to even come down here to look for me or whatever, right? When uh, a lot of it's grown out of abortion, right? We're talking about some very poor, vulnerable people who with health issues that, that are, you know, beyond comprehension. And you'd think you'd want to be gentle and uh, and caring with them and double check with them and make sure everything's okay, right? As opposed to just running off with their story and as, a, as a sound bite or whatever and so that you can... Uh, so that you can fulfill your professional obligations, right? I would want it to be done, yeah, ethically, with the review process and everything. I think would be ideal, but I'm an idealist. So. Thank you, um, Zoe. How are you, how are you thinking about how these issues, uh, from your own work, can sort of be applied to practices for mitigating harm? Uh, so I'm not a journalist, but we do work on long-term fish protection projects with different. First Nations and Métis communities across Western Canada. And again, like Nicholas and everyone has said, time is really crucial and, and we're taking our time to do our projects. And that's because the communities and especially elders who are giving us direction are telling us what they want us to do and what matters to them. And I have a friend who said like her job in the academy is to liberate the ill-gotten funds of the institution towards the communities they've stolen the money from. And literally millions of dollars flow through universities and granting agencies every year for researchers to study Indigenous issues. The and, recording has stopped. Um, so, you know, that is, um, you know, that's some, I think, a place where... This meeting is being recorded. Uh, just Sorry. to say that everything Nicholas said is exactly, that's exactly the vision that I think we need to get behind is that community should be directing funding, community should be directing um, the resources and communities really are who we should be listening to. Um, and, and institutions are completely complicit right now in, in um, kind of making money off of other communities experiences. And so that's a job those of us who are in the universities have to keep um, you know, supporting the work to shift that. Uh, and yeah, so every day I try to remember what my friend said when she said it was her job to liberate that money <laughs> because academics are not good, necessarily good project managers either, right? Like money gets spent on things that don't make sense, like flying people, to, you know, around the world to attend conferences when that money could go to community members to do really meaningful things on the ground. So I'm not, you know, like I'm just as problematic as an academic, you know, I'm trying to reform my own kind of ideas of uh, how to do things, but I think that there's really hopeful movement towards doing things differently. And that's, that's good. That's exciting. Are there ways to think about like there's there's funding that goes to research and then is are there ways to think about sort of the capital accrued by journalists um as as shareable with the communities they're reporting i yeah i mean yeah i think that uh you know there are journalists who i think do a good job of um like i don't know i'm i'm a fan of jorge barrera because i've had an opportunity to work with him in the past and it feels like he does a careful job of advocating for people but obviously i'm not a subject of one of his stories so i can't you know assess that beyond but sort of seeing certain journalists really do take on stories that i think other folks wouldn't and those include you know efforts to uh, address police brutality or um, you know indigenous women who've been wrongfully incarcerated those kind of stories take time and uh, trust and um, you know but there's people who are pretty happy to also uh, write in a way that 
I don't know. I'm, I guess like, I'm, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I think that you can feel the integrity in someone's work. You can feel if it's attending to obligations to a community or if it isn't. Uh, and I guess what I try to teach my students is to really start to trust their gut more. And you can, you can feel when you're reading something, if it's done with care, you really feel it. You feel that someone has spent the time uh, and I'm really trying to teach them to pay more attention to that um, because that matters a lot in what we produce in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think that we should really open open the floor to, to questions here. I'm curious if anyone has questions here. Yes, yeah. <laughs> asking a question at my own conference, so, so sorry. <laughs> um, but this is so interesting, and it's so interesting to hear all these different perspectives. And I guess um, when I think about the harms of fact-checking, I think one thing that we possibly haven't talked about and that I would love to hear people speak on is the interpersonal experience of fact-checking. Um, so I feel like we've talked a lot about community, um, but there's also the aspect of like the fact-checker will call a source and be like, hey, let's go through all your sources again. Let's talk about your experiences all over again. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a sometimes blunt way, um, without context, and maybe without establishing the relationship that the journalist has established with the source over possibly a really, really long time. Um, and so I'm curious to hear about um, yeah, what you think about how, how fact-checking should be conducted and how sometimes it can have harmful effects towards uh, individual people who participate in a story. Thank you for that question. Um, why don't we, we'll start with Nicholas. Sure. Um, I've, uh, I've been, uh, done a lot of uh, like interview experience. I don't have a lot of interview experience. I usually write like editorial pieces uh, that are, are mainly just me talking. But um, I suppose if, if, if I was to go with, um, an answer that, that's been known to create harm may be uh, questions around around um, speaking to the, the the person in a realistic way that, that from a perspective that doesn't understand. I guess, uh, like you said, the the relationship that have been built up for for a, for a long time versus uh, somebody that like a journalist that just is coming in with, you know limited information or limited uh, sort of perspectives uh, that they're even allowed to report on. Um, and then we've got, uh, you know, the personal issues of the person themselves that you're talking to, uh, their own biases, their own trust issues, and their own uh, sort of desire to, to, you know, vent frustrations or vent uh, exp express everything in that one in that one meeting or whatever, they want to tell you everything about, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end. And that can be, uh, that can be a traumatizing for the, the journalists themselves to hear, to hear every single detail of, of, you know, horrific trauma that a person's been through. That's not necessarily the context that the, that the, the journalist was uh, looking for. Um, but those, you know, those aspects are just as valid and important to the person. I mean, it's not a counseling session, obviously. Um, and there are uh, a lot of people around here anyway that I know um, tend to mistrust media because of that, because they won't, they feel they, they're, they're entitled to, to, uh, to speak to those issues that, and that the media, you know, the outside, they're so used to thinking that their outside world just doesn't understand them or uh, doesn't, you know, want to try and understand them um, and that their, their personal experience uh, is, is you know won't ever be taken seriously, um, and I think that's that's true. It's not it's not taken seriously enough times, but uh, it's mostly about empathy and, and compassion. Really, you can see when a person is struggling. You can see when uh, when you know the language barriers. We're starting to develop plain language barriers now that 
uh, that address the issues. We know from person with academic experience is obviously going to have a whole different lexicon and vocabulary that than the than the person who is picking bottles in the street or whatever, and that needs to be, you know, addressed uh, if you're going to going to be talking to those people or about them. Uh, and so we're it's evolving, you know, slowly. Um, whereas we need a more level playing field in, in journalism, even speaking with politicians, I guess, it, it, would, it would help to have a, a level playing field where they don't feel they're, you know, uh, that they're gonna be misrepresented or whatever, even if they're talking about shady deals and stuff. Oh, I discovered that a bunch of this stuff you said wasn't, wasn't actually true or whatever. Uh, is it, you know, is it really our, our place? I mean, it's our place to out them about that uh, in the public media, but um, to do it with better, better compassion you know, as to the humanity of the situation might might stop a riot or something. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Zoe, your thoughts on, on building that interpersonal relationship between that second person, that fact checker that maybe what hasn't built a relationship up to that point? It's a little bit different, um, but uh, I've been interviewed by CBC twice on the radio for two very different stories. One was my experience of being sexually assaulted, and the other was just someone wanted to talk to me about political anger, and both had the same producer, and the producer was so kind and gentle and very compassionate and really prepared me well for the first interview. Like, I almost didn't go on the air, but they really reassured me that it would be done with care. This was in 2013, so long before Me Too, and it was it was, it was was done in my hometown, and it was really, really, really thoughtfully done. And and I came out of that feeling really empowered. But the second interview was with a very, very, very high up prominent CBC personality. And the same producer prepared me and kind of asked me questions. And I was I rushed down to the BBC Ottawa, uh, you know, uh, to, to do this interview by distance. Uh, and the interview was so hostile and the individual was so hostile to my perspectives. And at one point I almost, I was, I was almost like, maybe I should just walk out of the recording booth because I didn't sign up for this. I'm not being paid. You know, someone asked me to take the time to talk about, you know, being a Métis woman and, and my political perspectives in a post-Trump world. And, you know, I don't know why they chose me. <laughs> uh, and it was just so hostile. And then in the end, that story got like downgraded and they didn't even air it. They put it as like a web special <laughs> and, you know, and it, and it, it uh, I think that exactly what Nicholas said, like the compassion can be really important. And I do remember like uh, Sheila Rogers has admitted many times, you know, she said, uh, you know, I stepped on people, I stepped on people to get to where I am and I'm working really hard to not be that person in now in my career. Like, and I, I think that that honesty really shows integrity. And I hope that that person who was really hostile to me someday can reach that level of self-awareness and compassion that, that you know their colleague within the same corporation has but you know like in both cases i'm fine like i wasn't harmed i just kind of left that situation thinking, oh i don't think i'm going to do cvc interviews anymore if they ever ask me again uh and and the and the lot you know yeah so and and just another example is i recently wrote an article that talked about my grandfather's experiences working in oil and gas in the 40s and 50s uh, and a non-Indigenous reviewer for the academic article, like basically accused me of lying about a family fact about like where my grandfather worked. Uh, and, you know, all I had to say was like, as per my last email, here's all the evidence <laughs> that he actually did this. Um, but I think that it's just important that people approach it in all the ways that Nicholas just described. Like, you know, there's another human on the end of the of the microphone or the, you know, the keyboard. <laughs> and. And, and I, I think it's important for us to, to just honor those principles of care uh, because there's enough going on in the world to, to harm us. So why add more harm to people? Um, yeah. I'm just curious on that second interview, did anyone follow up with you afterward or check in? The producer was deeply apologetic. Like I think she realized that something really bad had happened in the, that space and um, uh, that she, I think she might have even been a bit embarrassed that she had brought me in based on our really good working relationship from when she was in one town and now she was in another. Um, it's so long ago that I, yeah, it's fine. But I did, you know, I do turn off the radio when I hear that person's show come on. So I'm like, 
you're not a good journalist. <laughs> and that's just my own personal little pettiness, but uh, there's so many other people who are working differently uh, that, that they're deeply, you know, it doesn't matter really. Uh, Corinne, are there ways to, to build interpersonal relationships or things that fact checkers can do to not kind of come in cold and yeah, be completely different from the reporter that, that the person knows better? Um, I mean, so whenever I'm reporting, I find myself wondering why sources even agree to speak to me sometimes. It's such a, it's such a hard position to be in, I suppose. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like Zoe's story really kind of confirms that fear for me. Um, and so I think when um, like a fact checker is like re-reaching out to somebody basically to have that call, I think there's a lot that has to happen, I think, beforehand. Like, I think they need to have the right level of experience to handle, like, maybe a more sensitive story. Maybe, they, like, and definitely they need to sort of, like, be briefed on the context of the story. Um, I know the, the guide suggests, uh, that, like, having sort of, like, a pre-fact-checking call. So that's something that um, I think um, may be warranted in some cases. Um, that, again, that they've been given enough time to prepare for the call, because I know again, sometimes like fact checkers have a short time, short turnaround time to, to finish off a project. And, and maybe that's why sort of the, the tone of the conversation isn't like what it was intended. Um, and then also that the reporter has explained to the source, like what is going to happen? What is a fact checking call? Why we do it? Uh, how it's actually to their benefit to have their words fact checked and that maybe it's an additional step to make sure they've what they've said is was like actually taken in the right context. Um, yeah, so many, many more steps I think need to happen. Thank you. Um, questions? Yes. <laughs> I feel like Vivian and I are taking over our own conference <laughs> with questions. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, my question is kind of a, a flip side of what you've just been talking about, of obviously a duty of care is so important, um, but a journalist is also a journalist. And Nicholas, you did mention, um, you know, obviously journalists aren't counselors, but how, what, can you talk, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just like the boundaries that journalists have to sort of be upfront about, I guess, or um, with sources to make sure that the relationship is still clear, that they aren't your counselor, counselor they aren't their, your therapist, that their kindness and empathy is integral to their work, but it doesn't mean that that relationship uh, is, uh, yeah, is a, a sort of therapeutic relationship in any sense, uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that's implicit. I, I mean, um, you're going to end in places like the downtown east side. Uh, a journalist, I think, should have the responsibility uh, beforehand of of knowing that. I mean, given that they're going to speak to people with trauma, right? Trauma informed practices. So understanding that their subject might be might have stories of of sexual assault or or uh, police brutality um, to share, and that uh, support around that is, is is available to them, right? And that you might not be be that support, but uh, that you know that your heart is in the right place. That the reason that you want to share the story is is the right reason, uh, and that you, yeah, like you're not a counselor, but here are some options for you um, to look into. That I've you know taken the time that I will show care and concern and empathy that you've taken the time to to have those options you know available to them and ready to share with them when you when you interview them you know i'm sorry if this is talking about something that triggers you uh or you know but uh, my my position as a journalist is is uh, to the my obligation is to the public to what they read and to make sure you know make sure that that's true and accurate as as difficult as it may be to speak about um, and I think, you know, most of the times they do a pretty good job of that. The Tai does an excellent job of that, of letting people know that, you know, the stuff they read it, uh, in certain stories is going to be difficult um, and that there's options for it, right? Um, anything around residential schools, say, for instance, is going to be 
uh, complex at the very least. And uh, to, to just to acknowledge that in the opening um, is, is important, right? Even, I mean, you can go right down to the fact that uh, land acknowledgements, for instance, can be controversial. And to, to acknowledge the land that you're on as a beginning starting point is really, uh, it shows integrity, right? And for me, it shows an evolution of society to be, to be acknowledging that the land we're on, never mind what we're talking about here, the land we're sitting on does not belong to us. So everything after that is for Indigenous people is probably laced with some sort of trauma. So uh, to have that context set beforehand and that, yes, there are professionals out there that know the issue and that can deal with it. And here's the option to them. And if you need them, just let me know, right? And then to follow up with that, say, is this okay? The story we told about you, because you know, because we want to have integrity is, uh, is critical. Um, I mean, unless you can live with yourself to going through and, and digging up trauma in people's lives and then abandoning them with it. Um, I think it's, you should do that, try and do that with every story, right? I know it'll just enhance your, your, uh, your position, I guess, and you'll, you'll be granted with more, more access and, and more privilege in, in, you know, in the emotional sense, I guess, in the psychological sense. Than, uh, than just the average person or than the reporter who rushes through it and doesn't really, you know, take the time to, to show concern for the story and, and the people. Thank you. Um, Corinne and Zoe, do you, want, do you want to speak to this at all? This sort of how can journalists be clear about those boundaries? I guess I can go, but I'll I'll just say that I think this is a really tough question. Um, I know that I have like sources that I've been, um, you know, talking to for years even, and and I know that like that can sort of feel like like almost a friendship in a way, but it's not. Um, and so there's it's definitely tough when you've built sort of like a long term relationship with someone about. Um, and they're sort of discussing with you something maybe traumatic or difficult that's happened in their life and they text you frequently and things like that. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I find that I'm always sort of working on and like how to, you know, be compassionate, but also be clear that um, my primary role here is to sort of like deliver this story to the public. Um, and so I don't know that I have like all of the answers. Um, I think for me, I tend to sort of rely on like, returning to um, maybe boundaries around like time constraints and things like that. So um, really putting in reminders in every conversation that's like, you know, um, you could take, you know, you have until this day to like take this kind of thing, this comment back or, or uh, let's schedule another call where I'll like fact check everything that we discussed just to make sure um, I understood it correctly. Um, so just like dropping in maybe like hints um, or reminders of like what we're actually doing here, I suppose. I don't know that that's like the best answer. I'm sure there are more seasoned reporters who have better answers than that, but um, that's what I've been doing so far. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yes. So um, in uh, more, let's say, uh, sensitive environments when uh, sources are um, maybe in, uh, in difficult positions, like when they're affected by trauma or, uh, for example, war or, uh, let's say, traumatic experiences, and maybe the journalist is uh, in that environment too when he or she um, uh, proceeds with the interview. Um, where I have this question uh, for a long time in my mind, where does the uh, boundary between the job of the journalist and the journalist as a human being uh, uh, begin? Because, I mean, I, I have this, this image in my, in my mind. I, I'm sure everybody uh, here has seen it at least once. There's this, there was this picture that it's almost the, the symbol of the Vietnam War, uh, which, uh, in which there's, um, there are two girls, I, I, if I'm correct, 
that run away from a, an, 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 uh, an American attack that basically burned out an entire city. And, um, and the, the, the picture was cropped because in the original picture there were two, uh, two journalists, two, fo two reporters that were uh, changing the roles of their, of their cameras. So where does the, uh, like, where does the boundary between uh, the duty to report and the, the human aspect of doing something for the people who are experiencing like r real trauma in real time. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I'm curious, who, is, does anyone want to take this first? This question of that boundary between, yeah, being a journalist and, and maybe doing something else to help when Sure, I can try that if you like. Uh, I think a major difference there is um, like written print media versus um, news, news media, like, like uh, television media or filmed media. Uh, they have, you know, in print we have the privilege of writing the story and getting the, the words down and um, maybe you have a picture that goes with the story or whatever, but it's still not the same as as witnessing a live video of something going on like live. Um, and that's that will affect the emotional content of the story, therefore the emotional understanding of the, the people, uh, how they how they contextualize it in their minds and their in their hearts, right? Um, and <clears throat> I think that would be you know, in, in real life time, it's difficult. I mean, uh, to, to say, okay, there's, a, there's, there might be a bomb about to go off here, so just to, uh, look away if you're not into seeing body parts or something. Right? Uh, you gotta be sensitive at the at the time, uh, and and that that can be a challenge, I guess. That's why a part of the reason I, I stick to print media because I have that the tough filter between myself. And, uh, and the public that I can go through things I've said and that I'm not going to, uh, you know, traumatize people just with the, the imagery. Um, but I, I commend those journalists that, that go out there at the same time and do, do that work because um, that's where it's at, really. Like, uh, it used to be all about selling newspapers, and now if you can't keep their attention in a five-second TikTok video, you're not, you're not a journalist or something. But, like... Um, and those, you know, those are real. Those are real dramatic issues, and that are that need addressing. And for people to be able to see them and feel them and hear them, uh, make can make all the difference. Um, you know, maybe not for politicians. I think that's that's where it's critical is that if there's a lot of decision makers and the power structures that are that are behind all these all these uh, wars and 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 the, you know the chaos down here in the downtown east side. There's there's structures that are behind that and uh if they can be seen in real life time you know to have something to say or like see the you know reaction or the the, issue, the trauma that they're causing um in real time told by journalists who are actually living it too uh or you know or not just like to be able to see it in real time might make a difference in, in how they think about it right um as opposed to reading it in the paper the next morning over breakfast or something right hope that answers the question, I guess. I think so. Thank you. Um, I think that we were, thank you so much for your time today. I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you all for, for being here. And yeah. yeah, thank you so much, everyone. We're perfectly on time. So this is great. <laughs> um, and I also think we're leading perfectly. So we're going to have a 15 minute break. Um, and then the last panel of the day is on uh, trauma informed fact checking. So I think this works perfectly. <laughs> um, yeah, please have more coffee. <laughs> thank you.